to welcome everyone to our meeting Zoom mask ultrasound Zoom meeting tonight. And uh, we are so privileged to have uh, Dr. Jen Li Pan from Taiwan, who is a very busy guy. And I would say he is the premier regenerative doctor in Taiwan and in fact in the world. I first met him maybe five years, six years ago in Toby. That's the first right. time I saw him and he was invited to speak there. And since the time, uh, we, we meet in different places. And so uh, I, I, I could see that uh, Dr. Jen Lipan is one of the guy who is really a forerunner of regenerative medicine in Asia. And uh, he has done so many procedures, doing all these uh, uh, difficult uh, procedures. And uh, he is always posting difficult uh, cases as well on Facebook, if you will if you will follow him. And that is why uh, sometimes I just look at them. And also uh, he is the founder of the Global Pain Practice. Uh, he has a page in the Facebook. So if you'd like to follow him there, there's a lot of uh, members in that uh, group. And so I don't need to really introduce him a lot because everybody knows Dr. Jen Lipan. He's a physiatrist yes. initially. But then he is evolving into uh, a regenerative and uh, interventional MSK ultrasound, what have you, all the other things uh, after his name. So we're so glad that he, he has consented to give a lecture tonight because in spite of all his busy schedule, he still uh, find his way uh, tonight. So, but before we begin, let's just pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we are so glad to uh, entrust this meeting to you tonight. We ask, Lord, for your wisdom, for your blessings. And we thank you for life. We thank you for health, that we are still here, able, Lord, to listen to your talk, listen to uh, educational meetings, in spite of all these challenges around us. Kindly be with the frontliners, the healthcare workers, wherever they are. They, have, they are facing a very challenging task. And I know by your grace, by your goodness, Will be, they will be able to be successful. And also for our colleagues who are admitted in the hospital, kindly Lord, make them recover from their sickness. And we ask Lord for your forgiveness. If we have failed, they, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Dr. Jen Lipan, yes. welcome and it's all yours. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thanks everyone to have me here uh, to have this talk to you. Uh, I don't think this is a very popular practice in your daily pain medicine uh, as a pain physician, but I think it's very uh, interesting to have you with me and talk to each other and share some idea of how we can inject uh, bone marrow derived uh, mesenchymal stem cells or stromal cells into an uh, anthesial fibro cartilage, trying to enhance or promote regeneration of our target tendon and ligament as well. So as a pain physician, we do a lot of uh, ligament or tendon injections. We do intraarticular injections. We even we do periarticular, perineural injections every day. And most of the time we do prolotherapy because prolotherapy is a very, very safe and effective way to treat patients with degenerative painful tendinopathy or ligament loosening. And the reason that this kind of treatment is helpful is we are targeting on so-called anesthesis as the target of pain generator. But usually we do this kind of diagnosis uh, with clinical findings as well as ultrasound. But if you think uh, twice that this target of injection may only have a fibrous part of the anesthesis rather than the harder part of the anesthesis. So I will elaborate that later. So we use either dextrose, hypertonic dextrose, or we use uh, platelet-rich plasma to enhance regeneration or healing of that painful 
tendinopathy or ligament enthesis. And we have multiple choices of doing this. We can use the ozone, we can use vitamin B12, we use dextrose, and we use better rich plasma. So over the years, we have many uh, progress on doing that. For this case, for example, a torn, a focal full, full thickness torn uh, posterior crucial ligament after serial uh, ultrasound guided intraligamentous injection of PRP. And you can see on the right side of the slide, we can show exactly almost 100% regeneration after pleurich plasma injection. So this is good, especially for professional players who have time minutes to, for them to go back to the field. So this is a great progress in doing regenerative injection therapy for ligaments or tendons. And for later elbow pain syndrome, the evidence also shown that the pleurich plasma also have better results than the steroid, especially uh, for the time, uh, in terms of time and the results. But we know that the enthesis is not only the tendon part, it's not only the fibers part, it actually includes many kinds of different tissues. So that's the reason why we call it enthesis organ. That means there are many, many tissue inside that enthesis. For example, there is tendinous or ligamentous part, which contains collagen type one uh, fibrous tissues. There are also uh, fiber cartilage. There are also bones in that enthesis. So when we say that we are injecting something into the enthesis, we are not actually into the whole enthesis, but mostly or almost all into that fibrous part rather than the whole emphasis. And in these years, we have also developed the intraosseous injection, which means we can do some pupillary plasma injected into the trabecular bone of either medial femoral condyle here or medial tibial condyle here, for severe osteoarthritis of knee. We can even inject that into the patella intraosseously to relieve some patellofemoral syndrome. We can do that because there are some mechanisms proposed that the in subchondral bone have crosstalk with synovial tissues as well as the cartilage. So that's why the injection into the osseous tissue can have better clinical results. This can also apply in degenerative hip joint. So we can inject either into the femoral head here or into the acetabulum here. And they both have very, very significant better results clinically. As can, you can see here, comparing the pre and post injection, there is increased joint space after interosseous rich plasma injection into the hip joint. So we have intratendinous injection like prolotherapy or a traditional PRP injection. We now have intraosseous injection into the trabecular bone of some subchondral bone. But what if in, in between here? So we have uh, a mineralized fiber cartilage here, and we also have mineralized cartilage, fiber cartilage here. So how about here? How about the regenerative injection therapy into the fiber cartilage? So we call it IF injection. So IF means intra fiber cartilage injection. So this make it a very, very interesting if. What if we do this, if we IF? But I think it's not just a small IF, I think it's a big IF because it looks not that simple for us to do intra fiber cartilage injection. So this is why we're here to have some discussion on uh, the fiber cartilage injection with uh, bone marrow derived 
mesenchymal stromal cells or stem cells. And this is my talk outline here. And the first one is we have to know before we talk about the stem cells, before we talk about ultrasound guided injection, let's uh, do some deeper uh, evaluation into the fiber cartilage as the barrier. So as we have talked about that there are four layers in and regular and phases. That is the zone one, the fibrous part, the zone two, non-calcified or non-mineralized fiber cartilage, zone three, that is mineralized or calcified fiber cartilage, and the zone four is the bone. So do we have some successful examples of doing regenerative injection into the fiber cartilage? The answer is yes. So the first one is the recent publication regarding intradiscal injection of ultrasound guided into the interverbal disc by either by a dual image confirmation. And it's published uh, very recent. So it's a, it's a very new breakthrough and I hope it will evolve more successfully uh, in the future. Another example is the intersubstance degeneration of knee meniscus. It, at, in this examples, after that ultrasound guided injection, the degeneration has changed from grade two to grade one, as shown here, comparing the two slides, uh, comparing the two sides of the MRI, as shown here. But as you know, the injection of the platelet-rich plasma can only improve one grade of degeneration. It can't actually completely heal that torn or degenerative meniscus. So there are still limit for a meniscus uh, by doing ultrasound guided intrameniscal injection, although there is image improvement for that. And the third example of doing regenerative injection into a fibro cartilage is the articular disc of TM joint, as shown here. So the histolog histological evaluation, we can show at the left side is the control group, and the right side is the uh, PRP group. There is a great difference of regeneration regarding both the hyaline cartilage here and the fiber cartilage here. So the fibrous orientation is more regular and is organized in the PRP group compared with the control group. However, even there are regeneration or repair by doing ultrasound guided PRP injection into the articular disc of the end joint, you can see in this slide uh, by electron microscopy that the completely healing or complete regeneration has not been achieved though. So there's incomplete regeneration or incomplete healing of that fiber cartilage after ultrasound guide PRP injection. Not to mention the various kind of subchondral or subfibrous fiber cartilage or bone uh, changes in the enthesis for various kinds of uh, enthesopathy or uh, degenerative changes of the joint. So intrafiber inter cartilage injection by the PRP, it's actually evolving, it's getting better, but at, at the present moment, it is still suboptimal, right? So the border from the ligament, the fibrous part of the ligament to the osseous, the hard one in that bone, as you can see here, it's like a border in, uh, in anatomy slides and also in uh, electrical microscopic slides, there's this border between the fibrous part and the osseous part. So this fibers, this is border may 
be an unbreakable barrier for our uh, pro-therapist or rejective pain physiatrist to break through. Is that barrier unbreakable? So this is the question I'm asking me about recently. So I try to find some evidence to answer at least part of this question for you. So we know there's a barrier. So what more can we do for that? And we know there's a trinity of tissue injuring, including the cells, scaphoid, and the signals. So maybe the cells could help if we try to in recruit some regenerative based cells into our pain practice for the fiber cartilage. But there are still problems regarding what cells to choose. So why you choose this? So where can I get these cells? And when should I do that? And how do they work? So there are many, many questions regarding how we add the cells into our daily ultrasound guided pain injection practice. So let's introduce some of them. So the incisional fiber cartilage include four zones. We have shown that for you. But in today's talk, I want to reduce, I want to narrow down my target, uh, not including this kind of fiber cartilage, that is tenolabral junction, or I don't want to do some ligamental discal junction like here. And the other fiber cartilage, like a meniscus substance, like uh, triangular fiber cartilage, like intervertebral disc, like uh, labrum, either the glenolabrum or acetabulabrum. I want to focus only into the fiber cartilage at the incisus organ. So I apologize if you want to know about these. Uh, I will elaborate that in a later event in, uh, in Taichung, uh, Taiwan for the meeting two weeks later. So I will, I will I'll try to share that slides with you later. So we know there are four zones in the fibrocartilaginous emphasis, right? The first zone one is the fibrous part. Zone two, a mineralized fibrocartilage. Zone three, zone three is the mineralized fibrocartilage, and zone four is the bone. So this also applies in not only the tendon insertion as you see in here, the Achilles tendon. Also, it applies to ligament insertion. As you can see here, the ACL insertion. It also applies in even meniscal insertion, which where the meniscal root inserts into the tibial plateau. As you can see here, there are still four zones in the meniscal enthesis. So this is the topic of today's talk. We want to try to enhance the regeneration. We try to promote the healing process of this fiber cartilage in an emphysis organ, even in a meniscus uh, issue. We are not talking about the meniscus intrasubstance regeneration, but the emphysis of that uh, meniscal root. We also know that in recent years that the enthesis not only affected by the fibrous part or the other osseous part of the enthesis, it is also affected by the nearby synovial membrane. So that's why we call it synovial and enthesial complex. So this is a real complex, as you can see here in the left, that the synovial membrane, the bursal tissues, and the periosteal fiber cartilage and physios come together in a complex form that there is a lot of crosstalks in this area. So when we are considering regenerating or repairing the incisus, sometimes we have to reconsider that the synovial membrane or the bursal tissues may be, again, be the part of our target of injection, not only into the vision, itself but we'd have to look outside the box to see what kind of tissue is affecting that in 
So this is another example showing that the synovial membrane, the synovial tissues are affecting the enthesis. There are crosstalks between these two kinds of tissues. But traditionally, we know there are different type of cells in the enthesis organ. There are fibroblasts in the fibrous part, and that is zone one. There are fibrochondrocytes in the fibrocartilage, and there are osteocytes, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, etc., in the osseous part of that enthesis. So the cellular film pipes include these kind of cells, but the extracellular matrix is more complicated, and the collagen types are quite different in these zones. So that makes more difficult, make it more complicated when you're choosing uh, regenerative regimens for this uh, combined, this is a combo uh, tissue. So as you can see here in the left side of the slides, there's almost collagen type one in the fibrous part, but there are type two and three in the zone two, type two and 10 in the zone three, and type one in the osseous part. So they are quite different. And then the arrangement, the force transduction are different as well uh, in this uh, area of the incisus. So that makes it more, more and more difficult and complicated to accomplish the regenerative work. And can we see that in image study? As you can see, this is a very good three tesla and MRI for the incisus, but it's not quite satisfactory to tell the truth. And we change the mode, we change the protocol and make it more clear, but it's not still very clear. You can't see the fiber cartilage layer. You can't see uh, the mineralized or non-mineralized. But this, in this paper last year, published last year, they used a very, very high-end uh, MRI, which used uh, over 10 Tesla uh, mode of MRI. As you can see here, it's 11.7 Tesla. So there is an enhancement in the fibrous cartilage part of that insistence. So we can see even the periosteal fiber cartilage, as you can see here, the ancestors and the sesamoid part of the fiber cartilage, you can even see here. So the fiber cartilage and the fibrous part of the ancestors, using that high-end MRI, you can see the, the border between the fiber cartilage part and the fibrous part. So if you want to do an image guide injection using 11.7 Tesla open MRI, you can do that if you want to do the intrafiber cartilage. If you want to make sure that your needle is inside the fiber cartilage, not the fibrous part, you can use that. But you know, uh, to be to tell the truth, not everyone has this kind of uh, MRI in your clinic, right? So this is good, but it's not really practical. So we were asked another question. Can we use ultrasound to achieve the same differentiation? Can we use ultrasound to achieve the same definition of that uh, difference in the enthesis organ? So this is a great, this is a big question. And as far as I know, there is no such uh, ultrasound option which can show a clear, beautiful image like this, uh, as you see in the 11.7 Tesla MRI. So let's go back to the emphasis again. So in the developmental period, there are some uh, progenitor cells in the emphasis which can differentiate into different kinds of cells later in adulthood, which include the fibroblast, fibrochondrocyte, and osteocyte. I do not want to go too deep into that because it's too basic and that will make you sleep in one minute. So I will skip that detail for you. And during the inflammatory or the degradation of that enzyme, there are multiple 
biochemical process that makes the incisive to degrade. So we can target these uh, uh, receptors or process to make emphasis stronger. But this is actually beyond our uh, scope uh, today. And the most important thing I want to emphasize here is the incisis is not just an incisis. They have crosstalk, they have crosstalks with the surrounding tissues, with the fat pad, with the synovial membrane, with the meniscus, with other parts of the joint, not just incisis. So this is very important. So why is that important? Because if you want to regenerate that incisis, sometimes you have to treat not only the incisis, but also the surrounding uh, connective tissue to optimize your treatment, to optimize your regenerative works. So that makes more complicated. So in this example, we can see here, this is the normal uh, emphasis. You can see the layers, you can see the tight mark here. But on the lower part, as you can see here, there are fissures, there are lesions in that fibrous part of the incisus. And as we usually previously understand that we are always look at our ultrasound to see if there's a changes into the fibrous part of the incisus. But actually, when the incisus or tendon bone junction has changes, especially the degenerative changes, the changes would happen not only in the fibrous part of the incisus, but also, as you can see here, in the fiber cartilage part of that incisus. So there are double trademark formation here, the osteophyte formation into the mineralized fiber cartilage. There are microcrasts of fissuring in the mineralized or unmineralized fiber cartilage. So, if you know that the changes in the painful incisus happens not only in the fibrous part of that incisus, how come we just treat the fibrous part and neglecting the fibrous part? fiber cottage part of that incisus while we are doing a real regenerative work. So we have to include that fiber cottage part of the incisus into our consideration, into our pain practice, even though this seems not so easy. So the way to regenerate the fiber cottage, in, there are various aspects for that, not just, just in, inject inside. So this is also Trinity. We can see here the Trinity of regenerative medicine. It can include the cells, scaphoid, the growth factors, which was uh, abundant in PRP. There are also the force component that is mechanical loading, which is also crucial in making a fiber cartilage to regenerate. So not only the Trinity, but also adding the mechanical loading as the post-injection or post-seeding uh, induction of uh, tissue growth for a tissue like the fiber cartilage. So there are cellular considerations, which kind of cells are using. So the material processing message, which material you use as your scaphoid, which material you use as the carrier of your cells. So you have to make a choice for that. So there are also biochemical factors, which kind of uh, chemicals, which, which kind of a reagent you are trying to do with your injectant. For example, there are uh, some growth factors. There are even some uh, uh, hormones, etc. And what are the percentage of your recipe for that kind of com combination? It's make it more and more complicated when choosing or mixing your own recipe for fiber cartilage uh, regeneration. And even for not injecting one, even for a surgical uh, clinical decision, we know that if you want to make an artificial disc, but you want to make artificial meniscus transplantation, the best way to do that is to 
transplant the meniscus with its antithesis, not just with the meniscus itself, but also adding its own antithesis into the bone. They have far much better results than just transplant the meniscus itself. So the anthesis organ is very, very crucial for the fibrocartilage regeneration, not only for its own, but also for meniscus uh, regeneration. And there are other considerations trying to optimize uh, the ro a torn rotator cuff uh, repair, not just the tendon itself, but also the anthesis. They have to be mechanical resistant. We have control delivery of the cells. We have control degradation to expect some degradation after transportation. And we want to instruct or, or to try to attract more cells after the treatment. So this is very complicated engineering uh, for the time being, but we are physiatrists, we are pain physicians, we are not surgeons. Do we have our place in this kind of anesthesia regeneration? I think so, although it looks difficult. So here's uh, engineering uh, oriented consideration for a bioreactor design for a fiber cartilage. And as you see that there are different layers for fiber cartilage. So in the osteochondral bioreactor, uh, the researchers is trying to simulate the fiber cartilage regeneration using different kinds of cells. And they try to make different layers just like that in our native tissue in the emphasis. So that's why they use different kinds of cells. As you can see, there are two kinds of cells. One is today's topic, the mesenchymal stromal cells or mesenchymal stem cells. And here you also see in this kind of treatment, in this kind of research, they, do, they are doing the 3D printed scaphoid into the fiber cartilage using what kind of cells? The bone marrow stromal cells bone marrow and mesenchymal stromal cells, and it's topic of today's talk. So what is the cells of the choice? I think the bone marrow-derived stem cells is one of them. So why? Be because of money? No, because the bone marrow-derived MSCs combines both the regenerative pain medicine and the stem cell medicine together and trying to optimize the result of fiber cartilage regeneration. And they have multiple uh, functions, even in sports medicine, in cardiovascular and different kind of uh, organ systems. And usually we refer to the MSC, the mesenchymal stromal cells, they rely relies in the MSC niche, which is the microvasculature. So this, they call it parasites. Like here, you see the green cells are the parasites. And they also reside in some uh, in interstitial tissues of a larger tissue, uh, larger vessels. But the bone marrow MSC, they, re they lies in the, their own niche in the bone marrow. So as you can see here, they rely in the bone marrow and they have also cross micro crosstalk with the osteocytes, with the trabecular bone, and with the hemopoietic stem cells as well. So where can I get the bone marrow derived stem cells? We could do bone marrow aspirations, just like I can see, you can see here, uh, I practiced that in a Toby uh, workshop years before. So nowadays we use ultrasound guided, so that's why uh, we ultrasound, uh, sonologist can have our roles in doing that because the ultrasound guided bone marrow aspiration is now uh, being uh, a standardized uh, procedure for doing bone marrow aspiration. As you can see, they, the doctors, the surgeons use uh, ultrasound guided with a trocar to aspirate uh, on the screen into the pelvic rim. And the C arm here is the last step to confirm the needle tip of that trocar. So it's a dual image guided procedure 
in doing bone marrow aspiration for uh, harvesting the bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells. So I can you I, you can see here is the bone marrow ultrasound guided procedure. And after harvesting that cells, we do some culture process to expand that cells. So it's beyond the scope of today's talk. So after the culture, they have multiplies uh, into a certain concentration to make their injection more feasible and more effect effective. So the, the MSCs are ideal for cell-based therapy for many reasons. One of them is the multi lineage potential, anti-apoptotic cytoprotective effects. And the third one is they can have angiogenesis effect. And the most important one, it can provide a better environment. It can provide a better uh, biochemical surroundings by doing dual ways. One is immunomodulatory properties, and the other one is the trophic properties. So back to the history, the MSC was first uh, claimed by Professor Arnold Kaplan in 1991. So I think it's about 30 years ago. So this uh, cute uh, gentleman here is Dr. Professor Arnold Kaplan. So they have different uh, behavior uh, in vitro versus in vivo. So let's introduce what they do in in vitro again uh, first. So after some transcriptive factors, the MSCs can differentiate in different kind of connective tissues, as you can see here. So in today's talk, the fiber cartilage, the MSCs in vitro can be transformed into a fibrochondrocyte or hypertrophic chondrocyte here in this study. And in vitro, it can also transform into a normal chondrocyte and to, to produce cartilage matrix into osteocytes or for bone formation or into adipocytes, which produce fat. So that's all in vitro. But what they do in vivo, they are doing different works. As I said, that when the MSCs get into a tissue uh, area which is damaged or degenerative, the MSCs will do their job not by transforming themselves into different kinds of cells, but as a coordinator of tissue regeneration or tissue repair by various kinds of pathways. So one of them is, I said before, it's immunomodulation by doing either increased inflammation or reduce inflammation. They have trophic factors which enhance tissue repair or regeneration. They have some vesicles, microvesicles, extracellular vesicles, which brings microRNAs or et cetera to bring messages for the native cells to re repair or regenerate. They can even use as a drug carrier as a novel ghost uh, in the future. So there are different kinds of uh, MSC behavior to in enhance uh, tissue repair or regeneration in vivo, especially today's talk, the bone marrow uh, derived MSCs. So they have direct contact for tissue regeneration. They can release exosomes for tissue regenerations. As you can see here, they have immunoevasive, which means that uh, allogenic, which means uh, the MSCs from other people, they have some very unique properties which can avoid our host immune system to do a repairing or regenerative uh, works without uh, initial immunological uh, protection. So they can do their job before they are destroyed by our immune system, which that's called immune, immunoevasiveness. It's more like in a uh, Harry Potter uh, movie when, the, when Potter uh, dressed with the invisibility cloak that the snipe uh, professor can't really see them, but they can feel them. There are something wrong, but they can see them. So that's what we call immunoevasiveness. 
So when you're doing, uh, trying to inject some MSCs, bone marrow, uh, mesenchymal stromal cells from other people, they can do their works because they have some invisibility bulk on themselves. They can do a regenerative work either by increase inflammation or reduce inflammation. They, e they even have homing effect for tissue repair, as you can see here. So when you are trying to do some MSC injection in the later days, trying to remember these three numbers. That is 105, 73, and 90. So this is the iconic uh, self-service marker. We are trying to confirm that you are actually injecting the MSC for your patients. So this is the minimal criteria of confirming your cells are actually MSCs are, and not other kind of cells. So 105, 73, and 90 for menschymal stromal cells or stem cells. So as you, I, I, as I said before, you can use your own self, uh, MSCs or from other people because the immunoevasiveness, you can use stem cells or stromal cells. You can use the same day procedure, which use a concentrated bone marrow aspiration, or you can send them to the slab and make some expansion with culture expanded uh, bone marrow stromal, mesenchymal stromal cells. You can use the cells per se, or you can use the exosomes secreted, or you, we call it secretome, by the bone marrow MSCs. So we can do minimal manipulations, or we can use to manipulate. So there are many, many options, not just only one cell, not just one, only one choice of the bone marrow derived mesenchymal cells. So there are many, many other choices. There are many, many other options on making different kind of cells for a very specific reason, for a very specific purpose, even for fiber cartilage regeneration. So the recent uh, uh, publication, the recent research has shown very promising results because the combining the MSCs with the native meniscus cells 50-50, as you can see here, we can prove that they are actually real contact of the native meniscus cells with the MSCs, and they are also crosstalk between these cells. So this is the paper from 2019 August, an in vitro study that these kind of two cells can talk to each other and enhance the healing of the meniscus. So that's why we choose the bone marrow uh, derived MSCs for today's talk. And the other reason that uh, we use bone marrow derived mesenchymal cells because after the combination of these two cells use, we can see that the, regener the regeneration or repair of that tissue is somewhere more like what we see here in the fiber cartilage. So they can grow the tissue like a fiber cartilage here, as you see in the HNE stain in the vitro study. Then we, we migrate, we get more step into the other choice because we know that uh, the bone marrow derived MSCs can have positive effect on fiber cartilage regeneration. So what about combine them with some signals or scaphoid? So this is uh, another uh, research regarding adding keratogenin and PRP gel with the bone marrow MSCs and they have the best result of fiber cartilage regeneration. So that makes the bone marrow derived MSCs a very good uh, candidate as our future target cells for doing uh, ultrasound guided fiber cartilage regeneration into the enthesis. So after uh, the keratogenic induction, the bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells or stromal cells can transform them into the phenotype of chondrocyte, like that shown here in this slide. So this is a busy slide, but I want to your your I want to track your attentions on the right side of the slide, which compares 
the PRP with bone marrow derived mesenchymal cells, BMSCs, adding the keratogeny, those they are different. So why this is more important? Let's focus here. So with the keratogeny, as you can see here, there are more hyaline cartilage formed. But without keratogeny on the bottom slides, there are more fibrous part of that fiber cartilage regeneration. So that means using different kind of combination, we can adjust the composition, we can adjust the percentage of the ratio between the fibrous fiber cartilage or fiber cartilage with the hyaline cartilage. So this is how we can do before our injection for fiber cartilage regeneration. We can choose the percentage of adding how much keratogeny into our recipe for doing our regenerative injection therapy for fiber cartilage. So th this is very important. This is another uh, stain process showing the similar result of the more fibers for keratogeny and the less fibers for not adding the fiber keratogeny itself. So is the bone marrow MSC the, the perfect choice? Uh, there are also some uh, defect of uh, uh, short. There are some bad things about uh, the bone marrow MCs. For example, when doing regeneration therapy for osteonecrosis, here we can see that the fat MSCs outperform bone marrow MSCs in doing uh, regenerative work for osteonecrosis. So the bone marrow derived MSCs are not perfect in every aspect of tissue regeneration. They are only perfect in certain highly selective cases of regenerative process. But in fiber cartilage, till now, I think the bone marrow uh, MSCs outperform the, the fat MSCs in doing fiber cartilage uh, regeneration. So this trinity shows us that when we are going to do our injection into the fiber cartilage with a tissue engineering concept, the cells of choice will be the bone marrow uh, derived MSCs. And the choice of the signal would be the PRP, adding carotene or not, depends on what kind of fiber cartilage we are going to regenerate. And maybe the collagen gel is this, or the HA, arenoic acid, is the scaffold of choice. So, so combining these three, maybe we will have every pain doctors, every physiatrist, every pain sonologist will have their own recipe combining these three or four uh, components for their regenerative works. Now we go one step into the ultrasound of the Amphysio uh, Fiber College. Can we really actually see the layers of the fiber college without ultrasound, as we can see in this 11.7 Tesla MRI. This is one of the examples. So in emphysitis changes in psoriatic arthritis, we can see the irregularity of that bony cortex at the incisus organ. We can't see the fiber cartilage. Actually, we are sorry, I'm sorry, but you know, in this reason, this is today, this year's January paper. We only see the increased vascularity. We only see the irregularity of the bony cortex. We can't see, we can't differentiate the fibrous part from the fiber cartilage part of the emphasis of uh, this Achilles tendon. But how about this one? This is more, you know, high definition ultrasound. And as you can see here, there seems to be different echoecogenicity here. They're different, right? So correlate with that histological specimen here at the right bottom side of the slide is this incisio fiber cartilage. Is this the sesamoid fiber cartilage? 
And is this the periosteal fiber cartilage? We don't exactly know because this is the picture taken in year 2013. We only see they are different layers. Is this anisotropy? We don't know. We only know that there is hypoechoic changes at the junction between the fibrous part of this tendon and the bony cortex. We don't exactly know this is fiber cartilage or not, but it seems that in some cases, there might be chances that we can do some differentiation between these layers, but we don't exactly know. And this is tennis elbow example. We also see that there's a different echogenicity between the fibrous part of the incisus and the bony cortex. So is this the fiber cartilage in the incisus? We don't exactly know, but we can check. We can do some research regarding this aspect, right? And clinically speaking, this uh, research regarding ultrasound guided prothermy into the calcified Achilles tendon. It shows that they not doing, they're not just do prothermy, they do some fenestrations here. They do 15 to 20 fenestration into the calcified spot, into the incisifies. So with these fenestration doing into the area of fiber cartilage, we don't know because this is the, the paper published in year 1916. We don't know, we don't, we don't have 100, we don't have 11.7 Tesla MI to guide our needle into the area of fiber cartilage. So there's a possibility that they are actually doing interventions into the layer of fiber cartilage, but we don't know. So in this ultrasound guided injection into the rotator cuff, the needle are the, is, is the needle poking into the area of fiber cartilage? We don't know. But there's a, we, have, we have suspicions on this. So that means we are actually doing fiber cartilage injection in our daily practice, but we just don't know we are doing this. So this is, I think this might be the case of our daily pain practice. Even in uh, enthesial injection into the pelvis, we're actually doing some uh, injection into the fiber cartilage zone, but we don't know exactly if this is true or not. So magnifying that area, you can also see very interestingly that even in the a mineralized fiber cartilage zone, they are still some fibrous in digitation, interdigitation into that unmineralized fiber cartilage zone. That makes some injectate possibly entering the fiber cartilage zone, not breaking that fiber cartilage, but sending your cells, but sending your bone marrow derived. Uh, MSCs into the fiber cartilage zone via the fibrous part, via the fibrous interdigitation into that fiber cartilage zone. Is it possible? I think so. It is possible because it's not homogeneous in the fiber cartilage zone. In the incisus organ, in the amenorized area of the fiber cartilage, there are still fibrous part of that uh, area. So that means the resistance of the injectate is lower, far lower than the cartilage part. So there is chances, there are chances that we inject our bone marrow derived stem cells into that layer by not uh, destructing the fiber cartilage. It is possible. So how can how we can do that by ultrasound guidance? We can do that by ultra high frequency ultrasound. As shown here in 2019, that's last year, the paper said a 70 megahertz probe can differentiate tissues up to 30 micrometers. So that is the scale 
of instances. So in the future, maybe we use this kind of high, ultra high frequency ultrasound. We can differentiate different layers. Even we can differentiate different parts, the fibrous part and the fiber part and the cartridge part of that aminorized fiber cartridge and trying to inject our needle, trying to, to put our needle into the fibrous part and sending our uh, targeted cells. And in this talk, the bone marrow derived MSCs into that fiber cartridge part of the incisors. It is possible in the near future. So if you said, do I have that kind of experience? I'm sorry, it's still unknown but I'm, I'm optimistic for that. So this is number one question. Number two question is, in this enthesial zone, there are still type two collagen of that. So the fibrous part of that amylorized fiber cartilage is lower resistant to uh, the injected. So it may be, uh, it may allow a needle to get into that area. But this needle should be ultra fine. It's very, very small that can allow the um, ultrasound guidance to get into the area of the fibrous part of fiber cartilage. But you know, the ultra fine needle is, is very, very difficult to control. It's very, very difficult to detect in the ultrasound probe. But using the ultra high frequency ultrasound, can we see the ultra fine needle? We don't know, right? So this is the second unknown aspect. But by combining the ultrasound, but ultra high frequency ultrasound with the ultra fine needle, can we do that? I'm expecting that. So, so even in this kind of injection, doing ultrasound guided the protherapy intratendinous for acrylic tear, there are suboptimal results, not 100% of successful results. Why is that? Maybe you can think in a different way because in this kind of tear, we only think about tear and we only think about the tissue surrounding the tear. We think only the fibrous part of the incisus. We are not thinking about Maybe there are some fiber cartilage components in the tearing process of Achilles tendon degeneration. So instead of doing intrafibrous regenerative injection therapy, maybe in the near future we can do, we can try to regenerate a torn or degenerative tendon by the reverse way. We're doing intra fiber cartilage injection. And then by doing the crosstalk from the different area of that incisus, we can enhance, we can promote the healing process by not just in injecting into the fibrous part of the incisus, but also into the uh, fiber cartilage part of the incisus. So we have chances, right? So there are different kinds of uh, stem cell or stromal cell injection. One is a systematical intravenously and one is local injection. This is very successful in doing uh, intradiscal injection, but we don't exactly know uh, intrafiber cartilage, non-discal intrafiber cartilage injection. So in this uh, image, thanks for Dr. Chen Yu Hong, uh, uh, permission, I use this slide which shows their uh, uh, plate, uh, plantar plate in injury. So we usually think the plantar plate is a fiber cartilage. And we think that maybe we can do perilegional PRP or perilegional uh, pro therapy to enhance that. But now after this talk, you would already know that the fiber cartilage here is actually an enthesial synovium complex, which we refer to as a SEC. So this is quite complicated, not just the volar plate, but you, you have to consider the bursal, the synovial site, the 
the fiber college part, the bony part, all together to make a successful uh, plantar plate regeneration. So this is our chance. This is our challenge as well. So this is the histological uh, elaboration demonstration of that complicated structure for a plantar plate, not just the tendon, not just the incisus, not just the synovium, but a complex, the SEC, incisio, uh, synovial incisio complex. And how what about conjoint tendon? Uh, the ultrasound guided uh, bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cell injection into the conjoint tendon may enhance the healing uh, better than the PRP and thus may make that the entrapment of posterior femoral cutaneous nerve uh, more rapidly to heal. Uh, and this, I think this is a chance for that because conjoint tendon regeneration is more difficult than a normal tendon. We can even enhance or promote uh, ancestral augmentation, especially for patients with past planus, a flat foot patients, because uh, there are some elastic fast foot, and by doing some uh, regenerative work, we may have the chance to increase the arch of that uh, elastic or loose uh, long plantar ligament or spring ligament uh, as well. So this is our chances that using uh, stem cell technology, using bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells, we are not actually uh, doing fiber cartilage regeneration but, uh, into the painful degenerative emphasis. We can also, by doing bone marrow derived uh, mesenchymal stem cell injection into the weak uh, incisus to enhance their uh, strengths by increasing the long medial longitudinal arch to correct the biomechanics of our patients. So this is our chance. We can do it even in some slight lesions because a surgical repair doesn't guarantee a better result. So maybe non-surgical uh, injection-based uh, cell-based uh, regenerative works may be better in the future than a surgical repair. We don't know, but there are still uh, chances for us to develop more delicate, more well-designed studies, uh, more well-designed recipes for this area to heal, regenerate non-surgically, especially in the area with the highest density of neural filament. So zone one, two, three, four, we can do it in one way or the other way. And this also applies, uh, this is a very surprising uh, result that even in a patient with connectivity disease, with re rheumatic disease, there are still some mechanical issues in that disease process. That means we can use mechanical ways to reduce pain or to re enhance tissue regeneration even the patient has rheumatic problems. Even we have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, even we have a patient with uh, psoriatic arthritis, we can also do regenerative injection therapy for them uh, in terms of biomechanical issues in this paper. So in this kind of bursal uh, hypertrophy and the tendon uh, partial tear, in the old days, the teachers or the professors said, will say, oh, don't do prolotherapy, don't do PRP, don't do regenerative work for them because this is rheumatic disease, never touch that. But based on the paper that I've shown to you here, the immunopathologies owing to conserve response, they have mechanical stress as well. So in the future, maybe we can use, there are chances for the physiatrist or for the pain sonologist that we can help our rheumatoid arthritis patients or sorry arthritis, arthritis patients using a stem cell technology or bone marrow derived methods MCs by ultrasound guided uh, injection into the fiber cartilage 
or into the synovial membrane. So what about the challenges? Well, we can't really control the fate ourselves, to be honest. Uh, so the medical harnessing is difficult. And as in PRP, where the most concentrated PRP may not be the best, it also applies to stem cell technology. So the most concentrated, the most number of cells doesn't guarantee the best result. And choosing the scaffolding is a huge topic for uh, doing regenerative work for the cell-based regenerative medicine, but it's far beyond the scope of today's talk. But I have to emphasize that uh, choosing the right scaffold is the key successful factor as well when you're doing cell-based uh, RITs. So different cells have different identity, different cells have different purity, different cells have different strengths. So as a clin clinicians, uh, as a pen physiologist, as a pen sonologist, we, if you want to do a cell-based medicine, you have to have the capability of quality control. You will have to have the ability to define, to check if your cells are qualified for your patients. So you have to, you have your settings, you will have to have your own uh, facilities to verify these qualities of your cells. So there are different parameters of checking your cells. So even different types of lesions need different kind of cells. So in the future, you are trying to do a cell-based uh, regenerative works, you will have not only ultrasound procedure room, you will not only have your own clinic, you will have your own CPU, which refers to cell processing units. So you have a third part in your clinic that process yourself, that you to have to verify yourself before you do injection. So this is the minimal work for the, the only the basic of your CPU, and you have your procedure room using either ultrasound or fluoro guidance. You will have your own flow cytometry to calculate uh, your cells to to see the viability of your cells, etc. Even you have to check the FRMPs, the functionally relevant morphological profiling of your cells, especially when you are combining different cells together. As I have mentioned in the previous talk, that combining 50, 50% uh, of meniscal cells with the uh, uh, bone marrow derived MSCs. So you have some facilities to verify, to confirm for your patients, especially this kind of cell based. Uh, medicine is very, very expensive. So you have to do your paperwork. You have to do your, do your preparations first for your patient, both for you and your patient to do documentation. So there are quality control steps here. So there are many, many steps. Uh, I, I will not go into detail. So you have much, much work uh, to do far more than what you have done today with PRP. So this is more complicated. In Taiwan, uh, doctors seeking for cell-based medicine should uh, have their own special certification by the government to do so. Not every doctor can do cell-based medicine in Taiwan. So the patient have the right to try, right? But you as a pain physician, as a, as a pain sonologist, also, you have the responsibility to do the risk management. So this is also the challenge for you uh, to do a very good preparations uh, for the patients. And the synovium is uh, it's not a very, you know, we see synoviums every day, but actually we don't exactly know what the synovium tissue is. But if you're trying to do some fibro cartridge injections, you have to sometimes to to think about the synovium, to treat the synovium, or even to avoid some flare-up of the synovium, not uh, uh, to block your regeneration process, 
not to interrupt your regenerative process into the fibrocartilage. So this is also a kind of challenge for uh, regenerative workers or regenerative physicians to, to have their own, to increase their own knowledge of the tissue synovia, especially the synovia tissues surrounding your fibrocartilage, surrounding the infectious organs. And if the patient has some erosions in the incisus, what should you do? You do the erosions first, or you do the incisus as well? So we don't know. So even when the patient has an erosive arthropathy surrounding or beside the incisus, maybe we have to treat the erosion as cell to optimize your regenerative works. And this is the, some mechanisms uh, elaborated here for health and disease of the fiber cartilage. So uh, this is the paper, a very wonderful paper uh, published by uh, Professor Kevin Chang uh, in 2015. In this case, they, he do ultrasound guided probe therapy into the greater trochanter for uh, snapping hip problems. They have very good results. But as you can see here, uh, the injection into the enthesis uh, in previous days, we will think that this enthesis is only the fibrous part. But now we know the insertion of either gluteus minimus or the gluteus medius, they have synovium cells. They have bursal uh, space surrounding the enthesis of these two gluteal. Uh, tendons. So the prolotherapy, the hypertonic dextrose is injecting not into, not just into the tendon, not just into the fibrous part of the tendon, but also there would be some leakage or the fluid into the synovium. Would this uh, process optimize the treatment or reduce the result of the treatment? We don't know. So now we know that they are uh, synovial and intensive complex. So maybe in the future, when we combine the consideration of this kind of tissue, we can uh, do more, we can have better results uh, for our patients in doing intensive regeneration. Even in knee for the PCL, which I did a lot, and uh, we usually do some uh, intratendinous, interligament test injection, we do uh, at the insertion, but in this case, as you, as you see here, we maybe in this case, we have to do intraosseous injections for, for the pain patients because there are intraosseous lesions in, in this kind of PCL problem. So uh, an enthesial organ combines four, low, four zones. So after this talk, Maybe you have, we will have different thinking about, about intensive injection. We will just, we will not limit ourselves just into the fibrous part. We will try to con reconsider our treatment, not into the fiber cartilage part of the incisus, but also into the intraosseous part of the incisus for the patient, especially in knee OA patients. So is this a small if or bigger one? And how about the sequence? So we do the intratendinous first, we do the intraosseous first, or do the intrafibro cartilage first. So this is another problem. So this is one regimen, and this is the second. We do intratendinous first, and then we do intraosseous, and finally we do intrafibro cartilage. So there are different choices. We don't know exactly which the best. We still don't know. And how about the synergies? When we are doing the fiber college injection, is it good as we know in the in the plantar fasciitis or in the uh, uh, knee OA that after the PRP injection, we do a uh, shock wave. So can we do shock wave after the bone marrow, inje uh, bone marrow MSC injections? The answer is we don't know. And there are competitors. We, Nowadays, that bone marrow MSC is the best choice. But as you see here, the chondral progenitors, they have a similar result, even better results comparing the uh, CPCs with the BMSC. So we can see after day 20, 
the CPCs have better healing results across the meniscus because there are still holes in that lesion uh, when using bone marrow MCs. So there are still competitors. Uh, the bone marrow um, MCs may not be only choice uh, in the near future. But now it is still the best choice because considering the donor side mobility, consider reduced availability of the progenitor cells and reduced chondrogenic differentiation for debris uh, for the chondroprogenitor cells. Nowadays, bone marrow MSCs are still the best choice for regeneration into the fibrocartilage. And the mineralized fibrocartilage is still very hard to penetrate. So we don't know exactly we have to do the mineralized fibrocartilage injection or not. If we have to, is there any kind of a good way to inject into this area? We don't know. So let's make a small conclusion. Thanks for your attention. So uh, cell-based medicine, cell-based regenerative injection is very expensive treatment, uh, both for you because it's time consuming and both for your patients it is money consuming. So we, we better have a good job on this. But, you know, this is not the case now. So we have, even though the, the amount of your cells are so small, the, the job, the, the responsibility of the regenerative workers, of the regenerative physiatrists or regenerative physicians is to make your cells the biggest little. That means they have very, very small amount, but they will have very unique a replaceable role in doing your work. They cannot be replaced by PRP uh, or something else. So it should be the biggest little because it's very, very expensive. So we have to leverage this small amount of uh, cells into a huge or clinically significant difference for your pain patients. So the, for the present time, my conclusion, my solution is using ultra high frequency megahertz probe and trying to find some ultra fine gauge needle for this kind of intrafibrous cartilage injection. I don't know if you have a better uh, answer for me. I will come for that. So you can either inject uh, the vesicles, exosomes, uh, in the future, not just inject the cells. So you can make it cell-free to avoid some kind of side effects. So this is also the upcoming competitors for cell-based medicine. So these uh, cute smart particles are the future stars in a region. But even though you use these extracellular vesicles, the pain physicians, the pain sonologists have their own responsibility also to verify the quality, to verify the effectiveness before they inject into the fibrocartilage as well. So how about the IMSCs? They are also competitors for the BMSCs, but this is beyond our talk today. And as I've shown you to you, there are various uh, choices for uh, cell-based pain physicians to choose uh, for specific reasons, but there is still no consensus regarding which way is the best for very specific tissues to repair. So we have many, many puzzles to fill in, but, you know, thanks for your attention. Thanks for your patience. I know this is more like a serious talk, but uh, I, I, what I trying to make my best is to deliver a message of, you know, the mainstream of uh, uh, regenerative medicine, especially in the complicated tissue like fiber cartilage, the mainstream is the surgical one. The mainstream is a tissue injuring one. So it's very, very complicated. That makes it very, very extensive. But as a, a pain physiatrist, as a pain sonologist, as I am, I'm thinking about some uh, more convenient way, 
which against this kind of mainstream that is there a possibility for us to deliver a well-designed and skillful regenerative reinjection therapy for our patients which need a fiber cartilage injection. So this is not a mainstream idea, but after this talk, I would like you to think with me that there might be a chance for us to develop our way in doing fiber cartilage regeneration without the surgery. So thanks for your attention. I will select some of the slides here in my talk into global pain practice today or tomorrow. And uh, thank you, Jim, for inviting me. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jan Li Pan, for such a well uh, explained uh, lecture and very comprehensive lecture on uh, a very interesting topic on the emphasis. I have some questions here for you. Yes. And the first question is uh, about, uh, this is from Omar Batten. Uh, can, you read, can you read the chat, uh, Jen? It's, it's about, isn't the distance to the fibrocartilage junction from the bone pretty much narrow? Uh, where, where's this question? Is it, it's in the chat room. Okay. Uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, so, so you can, you can uh, because there are two questions from one attendee. So, right, just ask. I'll, I'll try to... Okay. Isn't the distance of, to the fibrocartilage junction from the bone pretty much narrow? That's the first one. Yes, it's, it's so narrow. So, so, you know, as I mentioned, that the mineralized fibrocartilage is, all, is now a very difficult one to overcome. But there is also a very, very less... Uh, evidence showing that the mineralized uh, uh, fiber cartilage should be a target of injection in a uh, painful emphasis. And I think the uh, mineralized fiber cartilage is a more important uh, target for advanced emphysial regeneration than the mineralized fiber cartilage uh, based on the current evidence. So uh, my talk will focus uh, today in today's talk more on a mineralized, a mineralized fibrocartilage than the mineralized cartilage. Thank okay. you. The other question is, how much are we aiming to inject? How much? I don't know, actually. So, <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, uh, for, uh, for to the Taiwan uh, example, injecting one cc of bone marrow MSCs would cost the patient 10,000 US dollars. So, uh, so you know, you, the amount is, is very scarce and you have to do a very, very good job with that kind of 1cc, you know, uh, cells. So this is why I'm seeking for uh, a suitable target to do a, such a, with a, such a small amount and make some possible huge changes for our patients. I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Jen, uh, because yes. this topic of emphasis really intrigued me a lot. <laughs> this, is very, <laughs> this is really an intriguing, and I was trying to uh, see the, also the mechanics of uh, osteoarthritis. Yes. And, and when you were explaining about the emphasis, and you mentioned about the crosstalk between the tendons and the fibrocartilage and also the joints, I saw that the synovial actually the synovia layer yes stands up to the emphasis level yes of course so is it possible that uh, when we actually treat either way we treat fibrocartilage or we treat uh, the joints is it is it possible that we should actually treat it at the emphasis level instead because i think that's where the that's where the war is is happening the war yes yes of course <laughs> So we have to re reconsider it, our, you know, our uh, traditional education on prolotherapy. So the traditional prolotherapy is that the uh, incisus is only, you know, a tendon and tendon junction and bone. But it's not because we don't really consider the existence of the uh, synovial and complex. So the synovial tissue is 
you know, a relative, we are familiar, but also strange. They, they, they are strange to me because it's, it's all new for me. We don't, we don't, we don't know much about synovium for me. Yeah. So, so doing uh, differential injections uh, may be a very good way to optimize our treatment in the near future. Right. And also, uh, interestingly, because a lot of pains in the joints is coming also from the subchondral edema yes. and, and synovitis. So maybe that link between the synovium going to the enthesis is the one really that, that, that kind of uh, find its way into the subchondral. Would you agree with that? Yes, sure. So that's why in some, some doctors nowadays, they do intraosseal injections. This is one part. And the other part, uh, new papers, new evidence showing that if you want to treat a PCL or uh, ACL insertion, sometimes you have to do steroid injection into the joint first. Mm -hmm. So that stop the inflammatory process for the synovium. Then you do the regenerative work for uh, the, the PCL, ACL, and they have better results. So I think that's why you have to, to include the synovium tissue into your you know, targets of treatment for the emphasis regeneration. So that is more, it's wiser for you to do that. Right, right. And considering that majority of our joints are in the fiber, fibrocartilaginous type instead of the fibrous type, I think uh, that really makes it really uh, interesting when you mention that uh, that fiber cartilaginous layer in the emphasis is where the target should be. And, and yes. that's really very, very interesting. Uh -huh. uh, thank you. Yeah, there's one more question here, uh, Jen. Uh, Pash, Pash, would you like to verbalize it so they can hear you? Pash? Yeah. Good evening, Dr. Jen. Thank you so yes. much for the lecture. It was truly interesting. So thank my you. question is, considering if we would consider the cost, do you think just one treatment would be enough? And if it's not, then uh, what's the interval between your next treatment, just in case? Thank you. Thank you. This is a great idea, but I don't have the answer. So sorry for that, because, you know, uh, we don't have uh, enough evidence to support the frequency, the dosage, even the protocol, uh, even the choice of cells, there's there's no you know consensus on that. So every single doctor have its own recipe. Every <laughs> single doctor has some proprietary uh, clinical secrets for them. So uh, I'll try to share with mine in the near future future because I'm now in Taipei Medical University Hospital. We are trying to do our first cell-based uh, treatment for patients with osteoarthritis. But, you know, to gathering the clinical data is very time consuming and it is very challenging. But once we have some initial data, I, I would be very happy to share with you. Okay, that's, what, that's, that's good. Uh, uh, Jen, we, I, I read a paper that was just published this year, 2020. Mm -hmm. They were trying to compare, this was done by Josh Hackel and the group, mm -hmm. and they're comparing PRP and the bone marrow stem cells for knee osteoarthritis, and guess what? There's no difference. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's why. You know, just doing it particularly uh, makes no sense to me. I think it makes no, no sense to you either. Yeah. So you have to do it very comprehensive. A comprehensive means you have to do differential injections. So you have to design different specific treatment for different tissues in the joint. For example, you have to do steroid into the synovium. You have to do the PRP into the ligaments and tendons. So you have to do the A2N into the synovial cavity. And you do have to do perineural injections for, you know, neural inflammation. So you have to do make it comprehensive because the knee osteoarthritis is a syndrome. It's not a single disease entity, right? Everybody right. agrees that, right? Yes. So every patient's osteoarthritis is different. So you have to do individualized treatment, aiming or targeting different painful pain generators. So that would have a chance 
uh, to have better clinical results. But you know, in your talk about that paper, to do a, the both arm comparison is the most simple way to do comparison, but it is not clinically wise to do that. It is wise to do paper, but not a wise way to do it for your patients. Right, right, yeah. So thank you very much, Dr. Jen Wuhan, and yeah. really a big applause to you for thank such you. a very comprehensive lecture. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dre. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Yeah, see you next bye time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And hopefully bye -bye. Uh, everybody learned something new today. So God bless and uh, have a good night. And see you again on uh, Thursday, same time. God bless, Jen. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Go home safely. Drive yeah, safely. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> See you. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Night, Dr. Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.